Please leave them in uh, the chat box. We will collect them. The moderator, moderators will collect them behind the scene and uh, we will have some time for a Q&A at the end and I'll bring those questions forward to both Orlana and Pam. Um, next slide here, which work. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of our endeavors to promote reconciliation, we honor the truth of the shared territory as we are all treaty people on Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Pakani, and the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Ahari Stony Nakoda, which consist of Wesley, Bears Paw, and Chiniki First Nations. We also acknowledge the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. In our ongoing efforts to promote reconciliation, we respect and honor the Treaty 7 Nations and their sustained connection to the land that is grounded in their oral practices. Mokintis is situated where the Elbow River meets the Bow River, the significant meeting point for trading and coming together, what we now know as Calgary. Uh, next, I'd like to go over guidelines to a safe space. Um, these are guidelines we use for events at the Women's Center. We welcome and respect everyone. We assume that everybody has good intentions. We all have capacities and we are learning together. We appreciate diversity and value everybody's voice. We treat and care for everyone equally. We recognize that we have all been socialized in a world full of institutions with power imbalances and isms. We value confidentiality and we are open to discussion to ensure a safer learning environment. Um, so next, I would like to introduce our speakers and then I, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our elder Doreen Turning Robe who will do a, a smudge and a blessing for us. But first I will go over our speakers tonight. So we're really honored tonight to have um, both Pam and Arlana with us. Uh, first, Pamela is from the Kainai Nation. She's married to Tito for 17 years, who is both from the Chippewa Cree and the Tohono O'odham Nations in the United States. They have two teenagers in high school and have lived in Treaty 7 for several years. Pamela has a Bachelor of Science degree, a Doctor of Chiropractic, um, medicine and is currently employed at the city of Lethbridge as an Indigenous Relations Coordinator. They both volunteered for several nonprofit organizations and enjoy creating short films. Pamela loves reading, traveling, attending powwows and gatherings. All of her parents attended residential schools and spoke Blackfoot. Her mother, Elizabeth Bighead, is a respected elder in her home community. And we also have Arlana Bennett, Red Sky, joining us tonight. Marlana is Anishinaabe and a member of the Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Northwestern Ontario. She's a PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta and a faculty member of the Summer Internship Program for Indigenous Peoples in Geonomics, Sing Canada. Arlana has received the Shirk Doctoral Fellowship for her dissertation research on the social, cultural, and political aspects of chronic wasting disease management in Alberta. Very interesting stuff. Her MSc thesis written uh, at the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology at the U of A focused on expert perceptions regarding CERVID, which is deer, moose, elk, and caribou management in Alberta. Orlando's current areas of research and specialization include wildlife disease management, wildlife conservation, indigenous harvesting rights, post-humanist ecology, and historical contemporary multi-species entanglements in the colonial scene. That is a lot of syllables. I'm very interested to hear from both Arlana and Pam. Um, so next, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Elder Doreen, Doreen Turning Robe from Sutina First Nation. And we're very honored to have her here opening the event with a smudge and a blessing. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Okay. Don't say, don't it. Uh, I'd like to thank Mother Earth. Thank creator for the gift of life we have today. We're all connected to the animals, the sun, the trees, the plants, the air, the land and the water from mother earth. Our ancestors are still within our DNA. I pray for the ones who have perished in the residential school system. And for those who are still healing from the residential school. Did you call the former? Creator, creator, 
showed this to the plumber. I was like, source, creator, source of life, help us. It's through the Help us. Thank you. Now I'm going to start with the smudge. And when we smudge as indigenous people, we take off all our jewelry, all the glasses, everything that that is our material. Because when we are praying to creator, we we pray with him and we have no material stuff on our bodies. We remove them from, from our body. And then <clears throat> I will say the smudge prayer that I, I, we do at work for our children. So we smudge our hands to do good things. We smudge our heads to hear good things. We smudge our eyes to see good things. We smudge our ears to hear good things. And we smudge our nose to smell nature and life. We smudge our mouth to say good words. We smudge our arms to do good work. We smudge our legs to walk a tall, happy path and we smudge our backs to be strong and tall. We smudge our hearts for our families, for our COVID families in the community. We pray for them. We pray for our family and for our friends. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us, Doreen. We really appreciate that. Um, so I think I'm going to hand it over to Pam then. And Pam, you're not sharing any slides or anything. You're just gonna chat. I can share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Nista Nithdaniko in a caput. I'm here in Sikokotoki. Thank you so much to Elder Doreen for that beautiful blessing and the smudge. I really appreciate you being here today. And it's so nice to have all of you joining us. What a great turnout. Thank you, Bobby Joe, for setting this up for us. We really appreciate it. And I'm excited to hear from Arlana as well. And thank you, Becky, for the introduction. Um, so currently I work in Lethbridge is the Indigenous Relations Coordinator. We have a new puppy, that's Yogi. You'll hear him a little bit. I, um, let's see. I come from the Blood Tribe, which is one of the five nations that signed Treaty 7. I, um, as I mentioned in my biography, my mom still lives in Standoff where I was born. I was born down here in Sikokotoki um, to my parents. And unfortunately, my father passed away in 76 from cancer. Um, my mom had six of us, so we were all separated because she was only in her 20s um, and a survivor of residential school. And her mom was a survivor of residential school. Um, and so, I was raised by my aunt and uncle from Picani. We lived mostly in Fort McLeod in Edmonton. I have been married for almost 18 years. Um, I have two teenagers as mentioned. On the side, I help my husband. He used to direct the evening news in the States. And so up here in Canada, since he doesn't, he's not employed, what we do is we create short films um, the first one was the healing and the second one was the love of two and then we currently have the virtual powwow the virtual roundups which started during covid in march and we're showing it on shaw uh -huh. and so when people ask me what do i do since i change 
careers and I change jobs, I often tell people, well, I help build community. That's how I would describe myself. Um, my, um, as mentioned, my mother still lives on the reserve. So I'm very close to my home community of Gainai. I, during this pandemic, there's been a lot of loss. Um, and then as you know, we have, we're still healing from the historical trauma that we have faced. And so it's been quite a hard time and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight and to learn from us um, and to, to have this dialogue. It's really important that we keep moving on and we keep supporting one another. I am a very strong supporter of the Women's Center. I was a board member from 2017 to 2019. Uh, we've been down here since March of 2020. And so I really appreciate the work that the Women's Center is doing in Mokinsi to, to build community, to bring women together, and the work they're continuing to do on reconciliation as well. So I was asked to, to speak about a few things. Um, the first one that I wanted to mention was that in 2020, the, the United Nations had declared it the International Year of Plant Health. And it's our goal to protect plants and what do they mean to us? Um, so as you know, the whole goal of the Indian Act was assimilation, um, which means which means let's let's get rid of any connection that you have to who you are for the Indigenous First Nations person and become Canadian. Um, and so the first big thing they did obviously was to sign the treaty. Treaty seven was signed in 1877. And there were a lot of rules attached to that, obviously. Um, my grandparents used to tell me how important it is to be able to roam the land and move and travel with the buffalo as the buffalo migrated to the north or to the south. And so when the treaty was signed and we were put on reserves, obviously that travel was stalted. And then the next big thing that happened were the residential schools, which had a huge impact on my family because they were separated. Children were separated from their parents, brothers and sisters were separated from each other. And so, and then they also lost their connection to the land. In my personal journey, what that means is I also lost my language. My parents all spoke Blackfoot, but then for me growing up, it was a hidden language, a language we weren't allowed to learn. They would actually chase us outside to go play in order that we don't speak the language. Um, and that continued through my whole childhood. And so when, we're, when I'm asked, what is your connection to the land? Well, I am connected to the land. I'm very, I'm very familiar with the stories that my parents told, that my grandparents told, and they're very important to me. So right now, bringing it back to 2020, I, was, I started the role here at the city of Lethbridge to do Indigenous Relations Coordinator. And it's a brand new role, it was a brand new um, position. And in that position for Reconciliation Week, we use this as our theme. And so what does it mean to us? Obviously, it means a great deal. And what does it mean to protect the plants? Well, the first thing is to teach each other about it. Luckily, Gainai has done a lot. They have kipa, they have traditional knowledge keepers, they have elders who are currently teaching us and they're collecting those seeds and they're saving those plants and they're learning about the ecosystem. Luckily, I still have my aunt who takes me, she took me to go berry picking. I needed sweet grass and without telling anybody, I was so lucky because during Reconciliation Week, Red Crow Community College gifted me with sweet grass because I live in Lethbridge and I'm not able to travel out to the reserve and collect 
sweet grass with my elders. So there's a, there's a connection that's been lost there, but then luckily with my community and the people surrounding me, we are slowly able to bring that back. And so when we said, well, we're, we're celebrating the year of plant health, it's those teachings, it's teaching everything that we have learned that we have lost. And then now that we're, that's coming back to us and coming back to us through our community and our connections to each other. So I wanted just to talk about a little bit about sweetgrass. Um, you, as I mentioned, you collect it. It's grown from mother earth. Our connection to mother earth is extremely important. You'll see that honored by women wearing wearing the skirts. Um, and those skirts are sacred to us because our teaching tells us that we come from mother earth and those that is our connection. And so for sweetgrass, we started today with a smudge. And I am very fortunate whenever I'm around anyone willing to smudge with me. We also smudge here in my household. Um, on a regular basis, we have the smudge kit. I call it a smudge kit, but it's the sweet grass. Um, and then we just light it. At the city of Lethbridge, we actually are not allowed to smudge anywhere. And so it's kind of like starting at the beginning again, because um, in order to bring that there, there's all these policies and procedures, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. and they want me to create policies and procedures, but actually my answer is I'm going to smudge with them. I'm gonna smudge with the fire chief. I'm gonna smudge with the um, with actually anybody in the office who wants to work with me to learn this. And then of course we have tobacco. Whenever you're working with indigenous people, tobacco is one of the first gifts from the creator and it comes from the earth and we return it to mother earth whenever we are, whenever we are working um, or doing anything. And so the tobacco we gift to our elders and our traditional knowledge keepers when we're asking them something, when we're going them to, to them for advice or for prayers or to pray with us um, or for ceremonies. And it's extremely important. The other sacred medicine used more on the West Coast is the cedar. Um, and then, of, of course, you have sage. My husband, as mentioned, is Chippewa Cree. And so we also smudge with sage here in our household and with our children. I wanted to move into a little bit about Treaty 7. So we have here the written Treaty 7 because obviously Blackfoot is an oral language. And so the way we honor oral language is we're sharing that knowledge through stories. Usually stories are told in the winter time. There's different seasons for when things happen. My grandfather was the one who talked to me mostly about the treaty, as I recall, because he um, in 1939, you have to remember, I remember my great grandmothers. I remember especially my great grandmother Onadaki and they would have been born in the late 1800s and my grandfather would have been born um, around World War I. And my grandfather helped start Indian Association of Alberta. Um, and so I have a lot of family who served as president there. My mom, when I told you I lived in Edmonton, we grew up in Fort McLeod, but then in early 80s, we moved to Edmonton so that my, my mom could go and work with, work as a secretary with Indian Association of Alberta. So I've already always been very closely connected to that work. And the most important treaty right that they spoke about was the right to education, the inherent right to education. So we're born with it. We were born and we have the right to be educated equally. Now, I wish that was true. Fast forward, I'm gonna be 50 years old this year. Fast forward to today, it looks different, obviously. There's a lot of other rights and responsibilities that we have to fight for. We have to fight every day for the right to housing, the right to clean water, the right to um, 
to basic needs, the right to food security. And so it's really hard to get to the point of that we're protecting our right to education. But we, but growing up, we didn't look at it, it that way. We looked at it as we have the right to education. So that means getting education on the reserve. So now when I sent my son to school on the reserve for grade one, he learned Blackfoot in the classroom. It was, it was there, whereas versus when I went to school, it wasn't available. I told you, they did not want us to learn our language. Um, and then now it wasn't, are you going to university? It's when you go to university. And so we knew that that degree was always the end goal. That was important to us. Um, we're still fighting for a lot of that, obviously, but we're gonna continue to do that. We're gonna continue to break those barriers and, and go through those walls and get there so that my children can go to school and get their education and go work in a profession, anyone they want to. They're not gonna be um, limited to, to jobs that aren't paying living wages, jobs that don't help them get ahead or help their community get ahead. They have that opportunity because of the work we're doing. And it started with my grandfather in 1939 when he went and fought with the Indian Association of Alberta, which is now the Assembly of First Nations. And he, and they would go to Edmonton, they'd go to Ottawa in order to meet with the other chiefs across Canada. There's more than 620 First Nations and they meet with the now called, I call it Indian Affairs, but the name these days is Indigenous Services Canada. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about this area, um, Treaty 7. So Treaty 7 was signed in order for the railroad to come here and to bring Alberta into Confederation in 1905. So that work that was done, um, it's, it would be really wonderful if you could speak with an elder who could talk to you about how that treaty was actually signed between the five nations and what went into it and what was promised. Um, obviously, the Indian Act came in as well the year before. And the Indian Act was the government's um, method in order to assimilate First Nations people. And we still live under the Indian Act. And I'd be happy at any time to tell you about what that means for me today. But we're still there. We still have to follow the rules of the Indian Act. Um, for Treaty 7, here in Southern Alberta, we have, luckily, we have the Blackfoot Confederacy now at Siksikatsitapi, and they are, they are um, making sure that the rights of Bikani, Siksika, Gainai, and um, Aps, Ap, I can't say it, sorry, Bikani, South Southern Bikani, that they will um, be well represented and that they will, that their basic human rights are also being met. And there's great work happening out of Calgary by the elders. They have a strong elders advisory circle that works with, um, with Bearspaw, with, with Chiniki. They work with Sotina um, and they work with the Blackfoot Confederacy. So this with Wesley as well. That, so this work is being sure that our voices are heard, our voices are heard to the municipal governments, to the provincial governments and to the federal governments because the way that the laws get passed is it is often when those governments all agree with each other. Today is a historical day. I've been watching the news faithfully today. Um, and we're gonna see, we're gonna see some of those changes and some of those treaty rights um, be protected and hopefully not hindered further by the Indian Act that we currently still live under. So I've talked a little bit about the Indian Act. Um, yes, the Indian Act is the what we're living under. Um, it gives us certain um, I will call it, it allows us access to some things. However, it's extremely restrictive. Um, the Women's Center has done a lot of work in education to teach people 
about some of the advances that were made, but obviously huge, we need huge more further advances in order to change these restrictions. And it's going to be based upon us looking at the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in order to get out from under this restrictive authoritative paternalistic approach that um, the current federal government is using in order to work with us. And it gets very complicated um, when you start talking about self-determination and self-government, considering the fact that some people like my mom, my brother, my family, they all still live on reserve versus me and my husband and my children who are um, urban First Nations people. Um, and so the way that it impacts us is all different. So my husband does not live under the Indian Act. However, my husband's not Canadian either. Um, and so that even makes it more complex. We'll go down a little bit. I think I covered all these slides, so we're good. Okay. Um, so I wanna I wanna let you know just a couple of the things that I am currently working on, just so in case you have any questions or you want to reach out to me with anything. The best way is email. My phone gets very busy, so um have to admit I don't always get to it but email I usually eventually get to. So what I wanted to mention about my current work is at the city of Lethbridge I am helping the Indigenous Relations Office located in City Hall. We're under the city manager and we're helping the Reconciliation Lethbridge Advisory Committee with their work. They're an advisory committee to mayor and council anything administratively that they have uh, comes to us. So the biggest one that just happened was the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. The city of Lethbridge um, asked the reconciliation committee to look at those 231 calls to justice and see how they would apply to the city of Lethbridge. We've they were able to narrow it down to 25 City Council asked us to come up with a budget, which we did, and we were just approved for that budget, um, almost half a, half a million dollars over the next few years in order to address those 25 recommendations. And so I'm gonna be very busy with that. Um, in there, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that will be happening immediately. There's a lot of work being done around elder engagement in this area starting with the nations that are directly bordering um, were predominantly, as I mentioned, Siksikatsitabi. So those are the areas that we will begin to focus on. But obviously we have indigenous people here in Sikokotoki from all over. So we will be um, working with them as well. We will be continuing to work with the municipal development plan and all the other plans. So if you're interested, you can go on the City of Lethbridge website and look up some of those, such as the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan that we follow to protect the environment and ecosystem. There was a traditional knowledge land use assessment that was completed with, this, with the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, and that's how we're protecting Mother Earth, how we're um, preserving the area and what our plans are for the future and then what our advice is. Obviously my role is predominantly cultural protocol and connecting them to the indigenous people down here. And like I said, I'm a community builder and I will continue to do this work happily because our children need it, our communities need it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Pam. Um, yeah, and if anybody has any questions for Pam, drop them into the chat and we can get to it uh, at the end of our presentation tonight. So next we're gonna um, hand it over to Arlana. I'm just gonna share screen here. Okay. What I 
slides here first. All right. Uh, am I able to share screen here? Hang on. There we go. I got it. <laughs> there we go. And I'll just start this from the beginning. There we are. Um, so I'm Arlena Bennett, um, Red Sky. I'm my membership is from uh, Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Um, I've never actually been physically on my own reserve that I am a part of uh, a member of. However, I was born in uh, unceded Sowetbik territory, which is in British Columbia, uh, central British Columbia. And uh, I do have a lot of connection to that particular landscape. And that's where I tend to draw a lot of my inspiration from. Um, and the conflict between um, as a status card holding member of a particular First Nation that I'm not in any way tied to in terms of kinship and where I find um, I, I do draw kinship from, which is in kind of a, a different territory altogether. I, I'm kind of working through that conflict, um, both internally, theoretically, in my own work. So just to give you a little bit of background about who I am and, and what I'm doing, um, I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. I'm working with Dr. Um, Kim Tallbear, and I'm also working with Dr. Brenda Parley. Um, I've been working with them for a number of years now. I'm also a faculty member of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. And in 2019, um, we put together a program for Indigenous students, primarily from um, North America, uh, South America, from Australia, New Zealand, um, really pretty much everywhere. And our focus was on um, my specialization area, which is chronic wasting disease. Um, if you're not too familiar with what chronic wasting disease is, um, and you are somebody who hunts or uses um, hides or products from cervids, deer, moose, elk, and caribou, I will say very briefly that it is a neurodegenerative disease um, that affects deer, moose, elk, and caribou. Um, it is in Alberta. It's actually endemic in Alberta. Uh, it's found from Montana, the Montana border, um, all the way up to Cold Lake. So it is in the Calgary area. And my research focuses on the kind of social cultural aspects of disease management of these animals, which are a particularly important species for Indigenous peoples, um, and the implications of that disease management, how it affects Indigenous communities, um, how they're being engaged or not being engaged, and I'm trying to push it a little bit further in terms of exploring the um, more indigenous feminist aspect of management and the implications of ignoring the perspective of indigenous women. And then also looking at the implications of generally just ignoring um, indigenous peoples in general, the, the political climate in Alberta is, at times not favorable to engagement with Indigenous peoples and consultation isn't always the greatest. So this has definitely um, informed a lot of my, my research. So I come from a very critical standpoint um, with a lot of this information. So I'll just jump into this here. So just some terms and definitions that I wanted to um, clear up for people. So what is Indigenous feminism, uh, settler colonialism, and the idea of relationality these are concepts that we tend to throw around a lot in uh, academia, but might not be so familiar to maybe other disciplines or people outside of that realm. Um, so just to be clear, uh, colonialis colonialism is a process that begins with invasion and involves and evolves as indigenous populations are displaced. And what I mean when I say that is colonialism has fundamentally altered Indigenous women's relationship to the land. It is that colonial intrusion and displacement of Indigenous people uh, is that is the direct ca cause of Indigenous women's removal from our traditional territories and communal uh, nation level responsibilities. This is reflected by the possession, uh, perceived possession or ownership of land and natural resources by a foreign power. So that would be the Canadian government. 
um, historically, European traders sought to negotiate and work with men rather than women. So women were supplanted in favor of men because of colonial patriarchal structures. Um, and this was counter to the societal structures of many indigenous nations where women primarily held the negotiating authority to control land use and movement and um, basically anything to do with land in general. So a further extension of this colonial harm found in present day struggles is the relentless neo-colonial extraction of natural resources from our traditional territories. In every case, women are beginning to remember and reassert their prominence as land protectors and defenders and authority figures. This reassertion of power is in an effort to protect those most vulnerable among us, specifically women, children, girls, gender non-conforming, and two-spirit people. Indigenous feminism then uh, has emerged in the environmental justice movement as a, uh, a direct response to and challenging of white stream feminism that tends to disentangle women's roles from land issues. Indigenous feminism recognizes that land issues are women's issues and the control and criminalization of indigenous descent is an, in an effort to maintain power over indigenous peoples and their resource rich territories. So indigenous women on the front lines of the climate and resource extraction struggles um, and development struggles are rearticulating their matrilineal and communal uh, structures that support and protect the important roles that indigenous women have traditionally had in our territories. These articulations are a reminder that we have always been here. Our authority comes from the land and we will no longer accept the destruction of our land. Drawing on this knowledge, research has begun to place emphasis on indigenous women's roles on the land from complex networks of knowledge about land use, sustainable harvest to harvesting small and large animals for subsistence. Indigenous women have a substantial and multi-generational body of knowledge that places them in a broader web of relations within these landscapes. So as we have seen in the past decade with the rising tensions between Indigenous communities in Canada and the Canadian government, it has become clear, um, a clear directive to clamp down on dissent from Indigenous peoples when the interests of government are tied up with resources in Indigenous territories where Indigenous people and women have taken a stand at nearly every turn, their actions are criminalized. And of course, we've seen this with Standing Rock, um, the Standing Rock movement. Uh, people were brutalized by the um, American military. Here as well um, in uh, Wet'suwet'en, which I'm, I'll talk a little bit about, um, Tiny House Warriors. Um, there's also a few other movements. Um, Land Back Lane in uh, Ontario has had some pushback. Um, and of course, the Micmac Fishers, of course, which we've all seen uh, has experienced some, some terrorism, <laughs> some white terrorism. So at nearly every turn where Indigenous peoples uh, are pushing back and asserting their rights to the land or to protect the land or asserting some type of um, pre-existing authority that comes from the land. Um, there is large scale pushback from the Canadian government. So when the federal or provincial governments do consult Indigenous communities on land use, as in traditional land use studies, for example, the complexity of Indigenous women's land use practices, especially those that are connected to a more spiritual practice and that reference relationality between people and the land, they are largely ignored. These issues do not concern the federal and provincial government since Canada understands connection to land in terms of ownership and economic value. Of course, lack of adequate consultation is an undrip issue um, that hasn't been fully ratified yet in Canada. Um, and it is certainly an indigenous, indigenous feminist issue since much of extractive land use has direct implications on the well being, health, and safety of Indigenous women. And that's what I said right there. <laughs> um, as an Indigenous academic myself and an Indigenous feminist, 
it is very clear to me that early settlers to this land use concepts such as terra nullius, which you may or may not have heard of. Uh, it basically means just empty land. Um, the doctrine of discovery, which is another one where they say, oh, we discovered this land. It was empty and unused, which is, again, another falsehood. Um, and savagery narratives, um, where basically they said that the people who did live here were non-modern, savage, backwards, and weren't using the land properly. Uh, these narratives are used to diminish the true complexity and humanity of Indigenous peoples, and still so even today you can see this. Um, the impacts to Indigenous women were far-reaching as later Christianizing influences came to supplant their prominence and replace it with a system of heteronormative patriarchal control. Western notions of gender roles, hetero, non, hetero monogamy, manned, uh, male land ownership, for instance, placed Indigenous women in dangerous and precarious situations by limiting their control over divorce or land ownership or the ability to remarry and roles outside of the home. So in more contemporary times, we see, for example, that the exclusion of Indigenous women's traditional land use practices, for example, hunting activities associated um, with the act of killing um, that women generally tend to take on, limits our understanding of how women engage with the land outside of Indigenous men's um, extractive roles. So by this, I mean, if we limit the definition of hunting, because I focus a lot on hunting in my own work, um, if we limit that definition to the act of shooting a bullet into an animal, then we ignore the days, weeks, and months long processes leading up to that moment that are typically carried out by Indigenous women. As well, we lose the sight of the intimate knowledge Indigenous women have of animal processing, like hide tanning, uh, food security issues that come with that, animal health, and transmission of traditional knowledge to youth. By erasing Indigenous women's central roles in their communities and disregarding their relationship to the land, male-centered perspectives are privileged, male ownership is privileged, male control is accepted. We see this in nearly all areas of governance where few women are chiefs and many women are in administrative type positions. Although these women are doing a lot of really great work, if they were in higher up positions, they would be able to make more influential policy decisions. The system of governments in Canada privileges male perspectives over that of Indigenous women. For Indigenous women, Defending the land is a part of ensuring the continuation of our nations. If the land is destroyed, either through pipeline leaks, resource extraction, and or development, the safety and protection of culturally significant life ways will be at stake. It is the responsibility of the matriarchs to protect the land, land-based knowledge, and ensure its future use for coming generations. So I wanted to point um, and focus on a couple of really, I feel, important moments in this resistance movement that's kind of been building in the past, I'd say, 10 years, since Idle No More, um, 20, I don't remember what year that was. But more contemporarily, we have um, Kanahas Manuel, for example, who is the daughter of Arthur Manuel. He wrote a couple of really good books, um, Fourth World, I forget what it's called, Fourth World, something or other. And then he had another book as well. Um, they're really prominent um, land defenders in Swetmik territory. So of course I kind of um, stuck with that and it really influenced me because that's the territory that I was born in, although I'm not affiliated with. So I felt like I needed to know and internalize a lot of their struggles. But basically um, what they're saying, the tiny house warriors is they're planting um, tiny houses, sustainable tiny houses on their territory in the line of the um, pipeline that's planning on coming through. I think it's the Trans Mountain Pipeline. But the intent is to occupy and not occupy, but use that land uh, purposely to put up an affront. And again, 
their actions for the most part have been criminalized, even though they're on their own territory and it is unceded land. So the legal systems and frameworks that pre-exist settler colonialism technically are still in effect. So uh, we see this, this kind of two world nation and nation pushback, um, which generally tends to disadvantage and, and not favor indigenous people, even though um, they're within the legal framework, correct and, and right to be using their land. So the tiny house warriors are, are still occupying um, parts of their territories. They still have um, houses that are up. Um, Naomi Klein is actually, she recently wrote an article, uh, article with um, Kana House and um, they're, they're still pushing back. There's a lot of allegiance between, um, you know, other nations in British Columbia, Wet'suwet'en um, and the Tiny House Warriors in, in Suwepmik and then across the country as well. I, I really see a lot of this, um, especially on social media where people are, are making connections digitally with one another and um, really pushing forward and, and giving momentum to one another in a really fantastic way. And I see a lot of this work being done predominantly by women and younger women who are kind of at the front lines of, of this communication front. And it's, it's really fantastic to see. So the Wet'suwet'en, uh, of course, have Unistoten, their Yinta, which they have been um, establishing as a place to go and heal against um, colonial intrusion, the harms of colonialism, and the intergenerational impacts associated with um, settler colonialism. And these women specifically, I wanted to focus on them because the, the perspectives that they bring are that belief in the connection of women and Indigenous people to the land. And the reason they're defending their territories in this way is because they see the effects. Um, the Mount Pauli mine, for instance, in um, oh, I've likely, I think it was likely British Columbia, flooded the water system there and released thousands of, of tons of tailings effluent into the water. And that is the lifeblood of the people. So the fish are polluted because of this. The, the land becomes polluted because of this. This directly impacts people who gather their, their food and their livelihoods from the land. So when women say, if you destroy the land, you destroy us, it, it's not an exaggeration. It's not a metaphor. It's very much real. So the Unistoten Healing Lodge and Cultural Center was constructed with the specific purpose of providing a safe land-based space for community members of Wet'suwet'en to receive culturally relevant community-based healing. Its construction, which I watched happen over social media, and it was really amazing. Uh, it's not about occupation of land, but, but rather about healing from the real, tangible, and inherited effects of colonialism in this country. I watched um, the live feeds on the day that the RCMP came to forcibly remove Indigenous people from their own territories in Wet'suwet'en. I saw live coverage of men uh, employed by Coastal Gaslink to pull down the red dresses, which you can see here in this image, um, that had been hung as a reminder of the real impact facing Indigenous women as a result of man camps and transient male work crews. Um, the red dress, for anyone not familiar, is a symbol of the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people who are no longer with us. Of course, the RCMP were there to protect the male workers who were desecrating the dresses rather than the women who were there making a stand. They were there to give a hostile presence, but also signal that, that Indigenous descent is a threat to the Canadian state. Indigenous people and women living in their lands is not occupation, just as protecting the land and the water is not protest. As the RCMP later, one by one, removed the matriarchs as they sang around the sacred fire, I couldn't help but realize that women like Frida Hewson and Kanahas Manuel and many others are the last line of defense against a colonial intrusion 
and extraction as they stood in ceremony being taken away by men with assault rifles and heavy body armor the contrast was too real they are the land defending itself the response to the apprehension of Frida Hewson and other women at Udenstoten prompted the hashtag shut down Canada from across the country. It was a further extension of the dis-ease and anger for how Canada and the RCMP have been treating land defenders and Indigenous peoples who are defending their territories against unscrupulous industries with threadbare consultation agendas. Reconciliation is dead was the call from youth organizing at the Parliament building in Victoria, BC. And as non-Indigenous people puzzled at the thought that many of us on the Indigenous front were breathing a sigh of relief, reconciliation was never for us. It was and has been about easing the settler conscience and ensuring that progressive politics were making amends. In reality, our women are still missing and going missing. Our descent is criminalized to the strictest degree and our erasure from the land still continues. So Chi Miigwech, thank you for having me. And if there are any questions, I'll be available to answer. Thank you. Wow, thanks so much, Arlena. That was really great. Um, yeah, so I just want to give everybody a reminder that at the end that I forgot at the beginning, um, at the end of the event, we're going to be dropping a survey um, in the chat and it would be super awesome if everybody here could fill that out. It's really critical for the Women's Center to be able to track how many folks are participating in these events um, for funding and other reasons. Um, but yeah, very like I can see people in the chat, uh, very powerful, Arlena. Thank you very much. Um, Pam reminded me when, when she was speaking uh, today, I, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to the presidential, like the inauguration at all, because there's a lot of other things going on in Alberta, so I just kind of forgot. Um, but, but, you know, it reminded me that today is an incredibly historic day for when it comes to Indigenous women in conservation, uh, because with Biden's inauguration, he has um, said that he will be nominating Deb Haaland as Secretary of the Interior in the United States. Um, and for those who are not familiar, Deb Hallen is an enrolled member of the Lugano Pueblo from New Mexico. And she's one of two, um, two representatives, uh, Native American women representatives. And she'll be the first Native American member of the United States cabinet and the first uh, Native American in charge of the secretary, the interior department of the interior. And that means she'll be in charge of Management of Federal Land, Natural Resources, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the National Park Service. So that is like incredibly, incredibly historic. Her nomination hasn't been secured yet, and she still has to go through the process. But yeah, with Biden's um, inauguration today, it's just like, that's a really, um, yeah, it's a major watershed moment. And I just want us all to, yeah, take a moment and acknowledge that. I think it's pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, we've had some questions in the chat. So the first one is for Pam. Uh, Pam, are you aware of other municipalities having a similar plan about implementing traditional knowledge, like similar to the plan in Lethbridge that you were mentioning? Uh, no, we've only done a little bit of research on who has um, implemented the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I haven't actually surveyed to see who has a TKUA. Um, no, this is strictly out of the words of Blackfoot people, Blackfoot elders, Blackfoot traditional knowledge keepers, and it has many recommendations in there how to protect and preserve our lands in this area and the water. Um, and I haven't seen another document like that, but also it's the first time I'm working for um, municipal government. I come from the not-for-profit world. So I guess that also means everybody go pressure your municipalities to implement something similar. Um, we have a question from Leslie in the chat. I think this is intended for Arlana. Can you speak more about the differences between indigenous feminism and what you called white stream feminism? in water protection work, uh, it's understood largely in the same way. Oh, so she's saying that in the field that she works in, it's largely understood in the same way. 
So what are the differences? Yeah, so um, kind of broad strokes. When we talk about Indigenous feminism, generally, we're talking about Indigenous women having um, a critique against the, the settler colonial state or, or whatever manifestation of the colonial state uh, happens to be, whether you're in the US or Canada. And generally the disparities or the differences between um, what we call white stream feminism, there are various iterations of feminisms that typically tend to favor um, white normativity um, that generally don't consider the project that Indigenous people are looking at, which is um, the implications for Indigenous women, the implications for Indigenous men, um, because our gendered relations are a lot different than your typical um, Western normative frameworks. So we kind of come from that perspective that regular feminism um, doesn't address a lot of the concerns we have because we see the concern arising from colonialism and the project of colonialism. So when you apply that to an environmental framework, um, and I'm kind of starting to do this a little bit in my own work, uh, critiquing a little bit more of the, uh, the green movement, um, climate change science, that type of thing, it typically it tends to ignore the needs and um, the very immediate needs of Indigenous peoples and especially Indigenous women. Um, Indigenous women's needs typically tend to get ignored. Um, everything tends to be on kind of a fast track time scale. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, <laughs> at least a little bit. You can always leave follow-ups for us in the chat too, if you want us to circle back to something. Um, I, there's this question in the chat and it's similar to something that was on my mind as well. Uh, this is for Orlana. When I think about chronic waste, is it wasting disease, I, I'm very overwhelmed by the concept of it. Um, and so somebody asked, what can we do to support your work um, with chronic wasting disease? And also like, I have a question, what do you see as the, the future of hunting um, in, in Treaty 7 and I guess in traditional territories across the province because it's everywhere in the province now. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a big issue. Um, there is one kind of silver lining to this whole situation and it is that transmission to humans has not been confirmed. So we know that um, in the United States, for instance, the CDC was following a group of about 200 to 250 people who had consumed infected deer meat uh, through a period of their lives to, to the end of their lives. And they hadn't died of, you know, transmission of chronic wasting disease. So there is that. Um, but in terms of, of trying to help um, with chronic wasting disease, it's uh, the way it's managed right now is very authoritative. And the province, um, Alberta Environment and Parks, is generally not engaging uh, Indigenous communities. So they're not consulting them like at all. So it's left up to the communities to then go to the province to seek any sort of assistance or anything. Um, I myself am trying to uh, work through and, and develop some sort of community-based monitoring program. Um, I'm trying to engage communities, um, letting them know what's going on. Like if they don't know, I, I'm pretty sure communities know what's going on because they're out on the landscape. They see the animals, they know something's up. It's just a matter of kind of communicating with them. How can you help the community? Ask them what they need. And then just, if you can, if you have the capacity to do that, definitely do that. And I'm available at any point in time, if anybody wants to communicate with me about that, um, I think I can provide my email, that should be fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question that I'm gonna pass to Pam and, and Arlena, if she'd like to weigh in. Um, but Catherine is asking in the chat, do you think there is a way to balance development and protection? Um, <laughs> you're shaking your head. No, I was going to say that we have to find a way. Um, so you mentioned the great news about Biden, which we're thrilled, my husband and I. Um, we also saw that he immediately said no to the pipeline. And we were listening to that. Um, so what he's telling us, because he is going to be our premier for another two years, what he's telling us is that's his priority, right? Like 
the oil and gas and um, obviously the coal mines. So these are, he has already told us what his priorities are, it's in plain sight. We are very concerned about the environmental impact on all of that. And I just wanna mention, there's a great video, um, Warrior Women, uh, that we saw at the film festival and it's excellent. It's not necessarily um, all of these issues, but it's just as crucial. It's still women standing up and defending our rights. So in order to find that balance, obviously I am, I do a lot of mediation because I told you my job is to connect two worlds. And I always tell people that life on life out in standoff and out on the blood tribe is different than life in the city in Lethbridge in Calgary um, and so we have to find a way to work with each other and to learn from each other and understand each other and so in order to protect the land obviously we all rely on water we all need clean water I have been a huge vocal um, person saying that even in standoff some places don't have access to clean water. Um, and so from the government side, because I'm lucky enough to be included in some of these conversations from their side, they're, they're telling me we're doing everything we can. However, they're also saying, but we need oil and gas. It's the only way we will survive. Um, so since I like a lot of you here tonight, um, don't believe that I've never I've never been rich, first of all, but I certainly have never been relied on oil and gas to feed my family. And so I, um, I, I think we do need to find that compromise. I think all those voices should be at the table, obviously, starting with the elders, which is what I tell everybody, you need their voices and their knowledge and experience. And we have to find that middle ground, how are we going to protect it, but also, we all dro drive a car, right? Like, so how are we going to do that? That, um, that That's huge. I mean, I'm excited. I keep mentioning Biden and Kamala Harris, but I'm really excited about that. But yeah, I wanna hear from Arlena too. Um, yeah, cause I, I take more of a critical standpoint on development. I mean, uh, chronically development when it comes to indigenous nations generally is not a good fit. Um, indigenous peoples and their nations typically are in a disadvantaged standpoint and a lot of times the negotiation is really one-sided. Um, I, I don't see it as being fair a lot of times, but then there are cases where, you know, development tends to benefit the community in a positive way when the community has control over that direction. And that really comes down to a matter of recognizing um, Indigenous governance and Indigenous governance systems as something that's valid, which is something the Canadian government has been historically very, very bad at. Um, but some places it's getting better on a provincial scale. And in some ways I see positivity. I, I see, you know, arm's length organizations in the environmental side in Alberta who are wanting to do that work with Indigenous communities to, you know, monitor wildlife, um, to, to safeguard uh, traditional territories for harvesting against, you know, extractive industries. It, it's a give and take. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, <laughs> I, I've seen a lot of bad, but there can also be good. And I think Indigenous nations, and especially the elders and the youth have to be at the table when you're talking about developing um, land resources. Thank you. Um, we have a few people asking this question for Pam. Um, do you feel like your work is well-funded? People wanna know like if it's supported by the, the city. Um, yeah, if you, if you have the ability to do all the things you wanna do, I think it's what people are asking. <laughs> well, if I want a job tomorrow, yes. <laughs> Um, no, no, Indigenous communities are not well-funded. Indigenous people are not well-funded. We have a lot of work to do in that area. Luckily, I told you I am a voice at the table. And as you can tell, I do speak my mind. Um, so 
the important thing about why I mentioned the work with the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Two-Spirited report is we went to council and we asked for almost half a million dollars and they said yes. So what that means to me is they are listening. And when I was asked, well, why? Like why Lethbridge, you know? Because <laughs> there's so many other bigger cities across Canada. And I said, well, there's a, you know, the Blood Tribe is the largest reserve in Canada. And there's a lot of great people doing a lot of really good work. Like you tonight, tonight you're doing excellent work. Everything that you've created here. And I think people are listening, people are hearing that and you can't ignore it. You just can't ignore those voices anymore. And this is showing it. This is showing how we have so many people coming forward with these great ideas and willing to sit on these committees and willing to work on these policies. As we all know, it's very dry work, but willing to do that. And with that, going to the government and saying, this is what we need and this is what we need further. So for example, one of the calls, one of the um, calls to justice is the creation of a women's shelter. Obviously, it's urgently needed in this area. We have Indigenous women and their children being turned away from shelters when they need it. Um, and in this report, we only asked for $10,000 to start. Obviously, that work could use 100 times that easily. But that's a starting place for us. And I'm really happy that this work is going on and that we have at least these dollars to get started. Yeah, thank you. Those are great points. Um, this question could be for whoever wants to pick it up. Um, how can uh, white women or settlers support indigenous feminists? Um, so I'll jump on that one, I guess, <laughs> since I'm the one that kind of brought it up. Um, I, I think the the best example I could give is to listen to what Indigenous feminists or Indigenous le activists, land defenders are saying, um, if you're talking about, you know, environmental issues, listen to what they're saying. Generally, they'll have a call out for bodies or people to, to come to the front lines, or they'll have a call out for we need items um, for our, our camp or, you know, there's lots of entry points. Um, as someone who wants to learn more about these perspectives, I say like if you're on Instagram, just start following, um, you know, these groups like Tiny House Warriors and, you know, all of these groups uh, will start to pop up and eventually you'll kind of get a sense of, you know, the issues at hand and what needs to be addressed and, and where you can kind of come in and then it's just a matter of really just kind of listening to what they have to say and I find a lot of my analysis um, is really influenced by what these people on the ground are saying and because they're not wrong and theoretically they're thinking very very complex ideas and and thought processes so it's a good place to start thank you um yeah and I would echo that Follow, just like if you don't know where to start the Instagram follow. Um, following Kahanas on Instagram has been like, it just to see the harassment that she endures from both the RCMP um, at her home and from settlers, from white people, from Blue River Clearwater, it's really opened my eyes to a lot of what she goes through um, and her family and other people supporting her there. So yeah, I would really recommend that you follow her on Instagram or other social media. Um, yeah, and it kind of opens, it opened my eyes for sure. Um, we had another question about smudging and I will again, let this go to whoever wants to answer it and maybe even Elder Doreen who's still tuned in might answer it. Um, but smudging has become mainstream trend and you've like see it appropriated in a lot of places. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Is smudging a close practice? And can you speak more on how this affects Indigenous spiritual practices and how non-Indigenous folks can be respectful of those practices without being appropriative? Um, I can start and then I, I also would like to hear from our elder tonight. Um, so I hear it all, right? Like 
I hear you can buy it online. I hear, oh, well, I did it to the whole house. We made a joke today. Well, the White House needs to be smudged. I mean, I've heard it all. But honestly, I can't tell anybody what is their spiritual connection. I know what mine is. Um, I know what to do around smudge. For Blackfoot people, it's put in one place. Um, usually when you enter a teepee, it's usually towards the back where the elders sit. Um, and then the smudge is used during the prayer. And when you're talking to creator, I know that here in my household, we use it and we pray quietly. Um, so for me, it's extremely important that I have smudge and that it's available to me and to my children and that we use it as frequently as we can. And I highly respect it. And I don't think I can tell anybody else what they should or shouldn't do. And I cannot speak for every Indigenous person either. I can only speak, tell you my story. Um, but I'd really like to hear what our elder thinks too. Sorry, Dorian, you're on mute. Um, if you just want to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so for us as Indigenous people of Canada and uh, with our smudging practices that we have here <clears throat> at home and here in at my work site, um, we usually that's a special time in our in our homes in this home when we smudge together i am i have my granddaughter she's she just she loves smudging when i just know when she's like uh, she comes home from school or she's having it rough i'll say to her do you want to smudge and she says yes and I tell her, I share, I share with her, showed her how to, uh, to um, how we went. I haven't had the opportunity to take her to the actual, you know, to, to pick it, but I showed her how to harvest it because we do the harvesting or we pick at work, we, we pick it two days in June and or July depending on the staff, because of COVID, we're only allowed certain amount of staff in the building. But yeah, so I showed her how to harvest it and um, she enjoys that. She enjoys the cultural aspect. She enjoys setting up the smudge. This last uh, Sunday we had to go, we went to church out in Sedina. I showed her how to give back the, you know, the, um, the burnt sage to give it back to the land. I explained to her, this is what we do. When you smudge, you wrap it up, you finish smudging it, and you wrap it up with a Kleenex and you put it away in a container for the year that's you smudge. And then you go when you have enough to put back to Mother Earth, you would go, you would say a prayer to Mother Earth and you would put the, you know, put the usage back to the earth. And, and that's with um, like um, Pam also mentioned too, you know, with the, with the sage that we, there, they do sell them too in the health stores they sell sweet grass. And my understanding is we're not even supposed to be buying sweet grass from, you know, from, from the outlets. You know, it's a commodity right now. It's so important, like the air we breathe, the water we drink, the sweet grass. It's a commodity. And people will come to our center. So they'll ask us for sweet grass. I mean, pardon me, not sweet grass, but sage. So we have these little packets, these little, you know, you get them at a jewelry store. And we put enough sage in here for our families that are out in the community. And they will, you know, um, take it and 
because a lot of them don't really know how to pick it or where to pick it. And in a city, it's really restricted, the sweet grass. Whereas you grew up, if you grew up in uh, Sutina or Siksika, you know, it's plentiful. Like it's right there in your face. But <clears throat> for us city dwellers, you know, I know where to go and, and yeah, so I take my colleagues to uh, a place where there's, it's, you know, we, we go there and we collect it in this for, for the whole year, like, and also at our um, uh, shelter, we also collect some for them because a lot of the clients that come to our shelter, they want to smudge too. So we have an elders room in this in the uh, shelf, and it's not geared to turn off the fire alarm. <laughs> you know, you, with um, we're not even supposed to be smudging in there. But um, now, when the weather's good, we go outside and we smudge, and that's where we smudge outside with the families at the shelter. And to me, that's the only way of connection that we can get rid of our negativity, our negative spirit, our negative energy. That's the only way we can clear cleanse from our body and it goes up to um, creator. Yeah, so that's the smudge. Thank you. Carlana, did you have anything to add to that topic? Um, yeah, just kind of going off of Elder Doreen a little bit. Um, one of the problems that we see with um, smudging, um, aside from the kind of cultural appropriation aspect of it, is a lot of people are are picking it and over harvesting it. So the sustainability of the plant is starting to diminish. Um, and that's a huge problem for especially nations in the, the United States where the particular type of white sage that is grown there or grows naturally um, is starting to disappear in certain places. And this is a sacred plant to specific nations. So we have specific teachings about this plant. We have specific um, uses for it. Um, in terms of people who are not of the culture wanting to um, smudge and, and use sage, what I would say is if you're gifted sage, use it. If you're gifted materials for smudge, use it like that. It was given to you in, in good medicine. So definitely do that. But I would refrain from encouraging people to purchase it because of the implications it has for the plant and the commodification of that plant. And if you're doing it in a way uh, where you're trying to connect with Indigenous spirituality without um, making a direct connection to community, I, I would be kind of apprehensive about that as well. Um, but again, if, if you've been gifted it or if you go out with someone to pick it and they show you how to do it and they give you some teachings about it, by all means, take that. It's, it's a gift. So. Yeah, those are excellent points. Thanks so much for that. Uh, so we've had two questions that are on the same topic, um, kind of something that I spend all my days worrying about these days. So we have people asking about the coal, Alberta coal policy, the hot topic of the week here. Um, so I had a question, you know, I think that this, what has happened in the last week with the coal policy is kind of really illustrative of what Arlana has been talking about. Um, so behind the scenes, like, Professionally, I work for a traditional kind of colonial conservation organization. We're trying to do better, but we've been working on this for a long time. We've been working with people like Latasha Kafrob at Nitsitapi Water Protectors for quite a long time, working to like bring awareness to the issue of coal and the recension of the coal policy. Um, and then last week, a white cowboy posts a Facebook video about it, and all of a sudden, it's what everybody cares about. So I think that that, you know, how Arlana was saying in Alberta, Indigenous voices, and especially um, the voices of Indigenous women are just like constantly ignored and suppressed even. So the question was kind of thoughts on the coal policy, the whole kerfuffle that's going on, or, you know, thoughts on is there common ground between settlers and Indigenous people moving forward to fight the coal policy changes. 
Um, I'm so I've been kind of following this as well, and I'm not particular like I'm not. Uh, I don't know the particular ins and outs of all the policies and everything, but I will say from kind of a critical perspective that in terms of, you know, can settler uh, ambitions and Indigenous ambitions kind of come together and, and you know, save the area? Yes, potentially, but it's a matter of like who wants what land for what purpose and why and, and who benefits the most from this. If, if everyone can kind of come to the table and say, yeah, this area needs to be protected and we're all on the same page about that and everyone can continue use, that's fine. Um, my understanding of the area in question is that it's public use land. Uh, in actuality, it's probably traditional indigenous territory. So, I mean, that's where the conflict kind of arises for me. And again, of course, you have a, a white cowboy who comes up and is like, this is an issue. And now everybody's like, it's an issue. Okay, I mean, if it benefits Indigenous people in the end, I'm I'm all for it, you know. But if it kind of it continues to be developed and and destroyed, it's not going to benefit everyone. So yeah, there's a, there's a happy medium I think that can be struck on this issue. Um, I'll just give a few of my thoughts. So I I had started the. I used to work at the University of Calgary and I started the Indigenous Public Knowledge Lecture Series and I invited um, PhD student Anita Lafferty to speak and she talked about her work in the Yukon and her nation and she spoke about the devastating if effects of having the selenium in the water and unfortunately that's the problem whenever these extractions are happening, it's often the Indigenous communities that are the most impacted by the, um, the runoffs that are poisonous. It's poisonous, it's dangerous, it's deadly. And so that's my concern about the Old Man River down here, which comes directly from the Rockies, like the area that they're working on. Um, it was this current government that, um, allowed for this development and it's happening. Coal is one of the most dirty forms of energy. So um, I am glad that people are speaking up and being heard. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it stopped some, but it hasn't stopped all of it. And I work directly, one of my coworkers at the city that I work with on waste and recycling, we're working on creating an education center at the landfill for sustainability. Um, Nicole Robinson, when she heard about it, she went out there and she started swimming. She's, she swam the river. I, I don't know how long, I'm just blown away how, how much of an athlete she is um, in order to draw attention to this. And luckily it was picked up by the media. And I asked her about it and she told me that she had to do something. She had, she's a swimmer, so she had to do something to draw attention to this urgent matter. Um, so I encourage people to keep doing what they have to do in order, oh. like, to change this, to stop it. That's just my two cents. No, that's great. And thanks for reminding us about Nicole. I'm just trying to drop an article in the chat about her swimming across the Old Man Reservoir to raise awareness about the issue. But that's kind of like what I meant. It's like Nicole was doing this this summer. Latasha has been doing so much work to bring awareness to this as well. And then last week, everybody's like, nobody knows about this. And nobody knows about it because they choose to only listen to specific people. That's like the root of the problem. And, and if people were listening to indigenous women more, they would likely be more aware of the issues, but they choose not to. Um, so we're almost at time. So I think I'm gonna um, wrap it up with one question to both of our great speakers and um, thanks so much for sharing all your knowledge with us tonight. Uh, you know, with the coal policy, with chronic wasting disease, um, with, you know, the plethora of other issues, you know, I feel a lot of hopelessness sometimes. I'm sure a lot of people feel that and fatigue. Um, so to both of you, what's something that brings you hope when it comes to Indigenous-led conservation and um, incorporating Indigenous uh, women leadership into these issues? Um, so I, I follow this um, organization, uh, Land Needs Guardians, 
um, it's an indigenous conservation initiative that's um, got indigenous conservationists working on the land in, in various areas. Um, when I think of Alberta specifically, I mean, there's a lot of work here that needs to be done in terms of indigenous led conservation and listening to indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women. Um, like we're really behind. But when you look at other places, um, I see frameworks and and I get a sense that, you know, people are pushing ahead in, in other communities and, and I like to take those wins elsewhere and see how we can apply them in an Alberta context. How can we make that work? And, you know, there's lots of people here in Alberta that I've met who, who really want to do that work. Um, it's just a matter of changing that government, maybe, <laughs> you know, so I'm hopeful. Yeah. Um, I get hope from my children. I have two teenagers and we talk about it, right? My parents, their life was extremely difficult. I look at my life and it was pretty hard. I went through quite a few challenges. Um, and then I look at my children and they, they didn't have drugs and alcohol directly influencing their childhood. Obviously we're still surrounded by it. We're still surrounded by the intergenerational trauma, the historical trauma, but they have the opportunity to be themselves and do whatever they want to. The youth, the Indigenous youth, is the fastest growing population and their voices are being heard. There's so many great youth advisory councils that are being created. Um, right now, I just see that it's my opportunity to create those opportunities for them. So even this grant I've been talking about all night, we have, we're going to be able to hire four youth to work at the city of Lethbridge. Um, and so we're, we have a call up to all the other business units and we don't have any parameters. I would love it if a law student applied, obviously, because I'm trying to get the declaration implemented, but there's so many opportunities this year and areas um, for them to step into this work and pick up that ball that I told you my great grandmother Anadaki started that my grandfather that my parents and now I'm passing it on and hopefully that they will be there to grab it and run with it and I mean look at social media that didn't even exist when I was growing up and that is huge thank you no thank you so much um and yeah I hope you all uh, like Pam and Elder Doreen and Arlena have been watching the chat, but lots of amazing comments from everybody who's joining us. Thanking you all for sharing with us tonight. Um, yeah, it's been really, yeah, really nice conversation. We really appreciate you sharing. Um, I'm going to remind everybody again that we have a survey that would be awesome if you could fill out. I think Bobby Joe's dropping it. Yeah, she just dropped it in the chat again. Um, and yeah, lots of people saying it's been phenomenally inspirational. Thanks very much. So I think that's it. Please fill out the survey, um, follow the Women's Center on social media and stay tuned for our next uh, events coming up.
I did it. That, take, that takes a while. I was like starting to help you. And Thank you. Double click. Like, I didn't want to report it to Zoom, so I had to like. I know. <laughs> but thank you yeah. so much, Becky. That yeah, was of course. Amazing. It was a beautiful session. Okay, cool. You're happy with how everything went, and I'm very happy. It was so good. I mean, good. yeah. I feel like we didn't get to um, answer a lot of questions, but that's fine because I think both facilitators left their emails in the chat yeah. so they can just like directly email them. But other than that, I mean, it was amazing, and I actually got like. 30 some responses on my survey, which is like awesome. not normal because I usually get yeah. like five. <laughs> so yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Like, thank you. Did you enjoy the session? Anything? Yeah, it was that? awesome. Yeah, they okay. were both, well, all everybody with like amazing contributions. And I think the questions were perfect. And I want to go read more about Arlana's research. It's super interesting. And I know yeah. I'm, I am, I am going to try to recruit her to our committee because um, yeah. I think she's like in Calgary now or moving to Calgary because cool. I think she would be a really helpful voice on our committee. Yeah, um, I think so yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. But thank Very you again, Becky. It was, it yeah, was no, so thank great. You. I'm just like so happy. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad I could help out. Thanks for you're the one doing all the heavy lifting. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being my speaker. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. okay take have care. A good night. Yeah. Bye. bye.